Hi, Dennis Weiss for Eagle Communications. Welcome to Why Like Ike. We always have fun things to talk about when it's Dwight David Eisenhower. And today, this is a new one on me, Jeff Nelson, who is a museum technician, an all-around good guy, and he sits over there and answers the hard questions about Eisenhower and stuff. We've got a little stuff, but the pictures behind us and the fact that we're talking about Eisenhower and science gives all the backdrop, all everything everybody sees is we're going to use a little bit to talk about Eisenhower and science. So how's Jeff today? I'm doing, uh, doing very good. Uh, we're going to talk about Eisenhower and science and specifically uh, we're going to talk about the International Geophysical Year, uh, which uh, oddly enough was 18 months long. Uh, it occurred in 1957 and 1958. 57 is a good year. Uh, it was right in the middle of the Eisenhower presidential era. Um, uh, I believe it was his uh, fifth or sixth year as president at the time. Uh, and the International Geophysical Year, um, in a nutshell, was a major global initiative to study the Earth as a whole for the first time in human history. You just saved 500 people from the need to Google it <laughs> if they watch the program, so to find out what it was. Um, That's an interesting thought. Um, we film all sorts of topics about Eisenhower. He was a general, he was a president, before that he was a boy, and then a man. So as we talk about Eisenhower, uh, you know, every time we film we try to link that stuff back together. This investment in science, the geophysical year, comes hard on the heels of NATO, World War II, and the trying to glue the world back together for the purpose of peace. So this is a science show today, but you can't separate Eisenhower from the right. cause of peace on any other topic. So science for him, this was just as much about the cause for peace right. as it was for the cause of science from everybody all around the world. Eisenhower's experiences um, both in World War II and as president um, led him to work very diligently for peace, uh, even in the growing Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, he worked so hard at peace that he came up with various programs uh, such as the 50s program Adams for Peace. He was convinced that mm -hmm. atomic power could be used for good as well as for creating uh, very destructive weapons. Um, science itself was growing in leaps and bounds in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And it was realized by leading scientists, specifically in 1950, they decided we need to have a major scientific initiative to study various things on, on the planet and see how it works as a whole. Now this had been attempted earlier. Uh, two, uh, two international efforts to study the polar caps okay. had, had been done in the late 1800s and in the 1930s. Neither of those were terribly successful, uh, primarily due to technological, technological limitations and economic limitations. All right. But the International Geophysical Year proved highly successful. Um, scientists being scientists and being very inquisitive, they started planning in 1950 for something that would happen seven years later so that they could get all of the logistics set up and get everything organized. Um, and I think this picture will show where it was focused. Now, w one of the major focuses of uh, the International Geophysical Year was the polar caps. Uh, this particular print uh, shows the initial founding of the McMurdo Research Station in Antarctica, uh, near the South Pole. Uh, the McMurdo Sound Research Station was the lead U.S. research station in Antarctica. Uh, and during the IGY, they moved from McMurdo and founded a permanent research station at the actual South Pole for the first time in human history, uh, the Edmondson Scott Research Station, named after two of the first humans to make it to the South Pole. And that those polar stations are still very important to us. They today. still exist. Uh, lots of scientific research still goes on there. Uh, as, as as you said right before we started, there are still citizens of Abilene, Kansas, That's that right. occasionally go down to McMurdo or Edmonds. They volunteer and, and to go do and work. support and work there. And uh, it it's so interesting to me. Every program we film, it's it's not hard for one of us, whether there's one, two, or three people here to talk about something personal that's still relevant today about what we're talking about on camera. Um, and 
to continue the relation with, with the Antarctica, most of the studies in Antarctica were related to um, atmospheric phenomena and cosmic ray phenomena. Um, cosmic rays being um, one of the most powerful energy sources uh, in the planet. Some of the discoveries made uh, down there helped out um, all of the nations involved with improving communications. Um, one of the reasons they studied auroras and mm -hmm. the northern lights was to come up with better ways to communicate with uh, each other via radio, find out how radio waves worked. Um, so the South Pole Station uh, at Edmonton Scott was primarily scientists and engineers, and they needed a way to run their experiments by the clock. You had to have very accurate timekeeping. And what we have here uh, is uh, an IBM Model 25 master clock. Uh, most people know IBM now for their computers. Mm -hmm. Before computers, IBM used to be into making clocks. Lots of clocks, very good clocks, very accurate clocks. Uh, this particular model of master clock, um, and I have in front of me here the pendulums that hang in it, uh, it's accurate to within 15, cents, uh, 15 seconds a month. I just had a thought I have to insert before I forget it. You know what you call the measurement for processor speed in a computer? Oh. How fast it clocks. How clock fast it clocks. Hmm. It probably comes from IBM. It probably does. Uh, so this machine uh, was bought by the U.S. government uh, for use at the Edmondson Scott South Pole Station. Normally you would find these machines in schools and factories to run okay. machinery, uh, multiple clocks. Right. So uh, all your high schools, all the clocks in the classrooms gave the same time because there was one of these in the main office. And it, electro it electronically controlled all of the subsidiary clocks. This particular one controlled all of the subsidiary clocks at the Edmondson Scott Station from 1957 until 1975. Um, the thing that's kind of cool about it, it's, it's very nice Art Deco clock. Uh, to get to the South Pole, they shipped it down to McMurdo Sound, put it on a C-35 aircraft, and dropped it on the South Pole from several thousand That's feet. That's always up. a good idea with a clock. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the first time they dropped it, the pendulum rod bent. So they're like, well, we need a new pendulum rod. Well, of course, it didn't come with a spare. Sure. They had to radio McMurdo Sound Station, who also didn't have a spare. They had to go all the way back to the U.S., to get one shipped down there and resent. They dropped it uh, just, just the pendulum string, and it bent again. Obviously, not something you want to be dropping out of airplanes. It's very bent. By the time they bent the second one, the scientists and engineers at the station had managed there to straighten go. the first one themselves and, and get the clock running. Um, and I, I've read a little uh, about polar expeditions over the years, and I think that a lot of things were bent. And, yes. and not, not just bent physically, but the conditions there caused instrumentation to do all sorts of things that it didn't do in more temperate climates. Yeah. So adapt to survive and adapt to continue the scientific mission was always part of what goes on, I think, on those polar Yes, I mean, the, the, the South Pole is one of the most inhospitable places that humans have a permanent presence. Uh, the Edmondson Scott Station is still open, uh, we're on the third facility at the same place, though. The first facility from 57 to 75 is now under about 30 feet of snow. Um, this clock came to us. Uh, it's kind of a fun story. Um, a, a, an engineer from NASA um, donated it to us. Uh, oh, really? Uh, Gene uh, Sh Schwimmer. Um, he's retired. He's, he lives in Washington State now. Um, but his his offices, most of his career for NASA were in Houston, uh, as you might guess. But uh, in the late 70s, he was sent down to the Edmondson Scott Station to do some engineering. That was the second station. When he was down there, the station director gave him a tour of the first station, which was not quite buried yet, but mm -hmm. pretty close. And he saw this clock sitting wow. in the old main control room, which had been abandoned for sure. three or four years. And he was a bit of a, a, a clock aficionado, I guess. And talked up the director about what a great clock this was. About three months after he returned to Houston, a gigantic crate <laughs> showed up at the door to this guy's laboratory. And it was this clock that the director wow. of Edmondson Scott sent up to him and said, you liked the clock? And it's in an abandoned building and it's obsolete equipment. It's all yours. You know, that's a cool personal story. Yeah. Uh, 
but for us at the Eisenhower Presidential Library, Museum, and Boyhood Home, it's the preservation of history for the benefit of future. And we have it here because a little over a year and a half, this is very recent, William told us before we started filming today. So somebody's generosity has allowed this artifact to be able to be here to teach, to show, to help people remember well, and this and, event. And, and Mr. Uh, Schwimmer picked the Eisenhower Library specifically because of Eisenhower's support for science in the 50s and things like the uh, right. International Geophysical Year. So we have on the big pictures behind us, which uh, the staff here does an amazing job <laughs> of putting things behind us so we can see them. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, two men and gentlemen, one of which is Eisenhower, and then the backdrop over there looking at the, the rocket, and we know the other one's Mr. Von Braun. Right. So um, we have an artifact here that I'm not going to pick up and hold up, uh, <laughs> but what it has on it's a, a rocket launch, and right. uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's Atlas one. It's, it's a redstone which eventually became an Atlas yeah. rocket. Okay. Um, uh, right. Explorer one is the first U.S satellite in orbit uh, in January of 1958. Um, the, the most common story for the space race is that the U.S. was surprised when the Soviets launched Sputnik in 1957. Doing some research into the International Geophysical Year, both nations had publicly stated that they were going to orbit right. satellites as right. part of the scientific study. It's just that the Russians got there first. You've let me a, a, a question, a topic I've always wanted to ask somebody, so you're it. Okay. 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 I've heard it many times. We were surprised by Sputnik. Uh, you just, what you just said leads me to be able to say my personal thought. I, I never thought that's accurate. It right. may be true, but it's not accurate. I think we were surprised that it worked. Well, we were surprised they got there first. Yeah. Um, and somewhat surprised it worked. We knew the Soviets, or the U.S. knew the Soviets were working on mm -hmm. rocketry, sure. just like the U.S. was. Sure. Both sides, at the end of World War II, had raced to capture Nazi technology mm -hmm. uh, of rockets. You know, Werner Braun, Braun One of them. came in um, from Germany uh, after the war, or, or was brought in to work on U.S. Um, space program. Um, it does turn out that while the Soviets got there first, the U.S. equipment was technologically more advanced, yeah. uh, primarily meaning, and, and it seems kind of counterintuitive, the Russians had to launch a big satellite because all they had was big stuff and their electronics right. wasn't mm -hmm. miniaturized yet. The U.S. could launch a much smaller satellite but more powerful scientifically because U.S. electronics had been miniaturized more successfully thanks to companies like IBM. Artifacts here always give me a time to talk about what's interesting to me, and, and you just hit upon one. Um, the technological superiority of the United States in things we do has never been based solely on volume, but in efficiency of operation. So there was a time we could also produce more half-ton, two-ton, five-ton trucks than the other guys but they were better trucks too. Right. They were better, they lasted longer, the bearings were better, the axle shafts were better, all of those things that make trucks go. We created better technology, still true today. Hey, we're gonna take a little short break, we'll come okay. back and talk about Eisenhower and science, and we're expecting you to be there when we do. Around here we believe in local values, like hard work, family time, or a fair price on reliable internet from a local company. That's why Eagle Communications delivers great local values, like a range of internet options to fit your family's needs. Fast and consistent enough to power everyone's devices at once. All at reasonable prices we're proud to offer our friends and neighbors. Ready for better internet? Give us a call or visit eaglecom.net and discover our local values today. Hi, Dennis Weiss and Jeff Nelson back, and we're talking about Eisenhower and science today on Why Like Ike, and uh, we, I have my little button on, and there's a thousand and one reasons per day why we like Ike. But the reality of it is, we go the extra mile to appeal to somebody out there on a, watching on TV or on the internet about something they're interested in. In the United States of America and all over the world, science is still one of the things that motivates and drives people to do great things. Right. So we're talking about great man and great things. 
the International Geophysical Year, 60-some nations. 67 nations. Uh, by 1957, 67 nations were involved, uh, including several nations that don't really exist anymore. They've changed names since then. Uh, over 60,000 scientists and support personnel in over 3,000 research stations globally. Uh, that uh, studies included on land, for example, in the South Pole, uh, undersea studies. Uh, there were um, several joint U.S., British, joint U.S., European expeditions uh, to study the oceans uh, to their very, very deepest depth, depths, including the Mariana Trench in the Pacific, which is, uh, I believe, 11,000 meters deep. Um, Space exploration, as we mentioned, with the launch of the um, first uh, satellites uh, into space, uh, the discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts in near space, uh, which uh, led to a, a lot of work in contextualizing how the Earth uh, fits within the solar system mm -hmm. and some of the effects of the sun. Uh, the reason 1957 was picked, oddly enough, had nothing to do with Earth. It had everything to do with the sun. Okay. Uh, 1957 was picked as the research year because it was expected to be a very busy year for sun flares and sunspots. And part of the research was focused on st studying how radiation interacts with our atmosphere, primarily as a way to improve communications and, you know, and a so way to make the world smaller for people. We uh, deliver television, we deliver internet mm -hmm. service, we deliver transport all over the world via fiber. Right. We deliver dial tone so people can talk on the phone. You know what, no, our, one of our number one issues that the guys with screwdrivers and wrenches worry about every day? Solar spots and sun flares right. because everything we transmit, even on glass, is still has an RF component, right. radio frequency component somewhere along its life. And radio frequency, RF, if it is not shielded, from those events will cause degradation in function. So, you know, when somebody's TV goes blink, 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 could be a sunspot. Could be a sunspot. Could coming be Coming in through our Earth stations. Right. Um, to the yeah, cable plant. That picture again, uh, the Antarctica, uh, a weather station uh, used during the International Geophysical Year. This one's a, a bit different than your backyard weather station in that it's nuclear powered. Um, uh, it was at the Bird Scientific Station, which was another U.S. station. Um, one result of the International Geophysical Year uh, specifically for Antarctica was uh, quite unusual in human terms. The countries involved created a treaty that prohibited mm -hmm. nations from claiming Antarctica as their own. Right. So Antarctica, the entire continent, while it has research stations from um, several nations, if not dozens of nations, is kind of a global trust held for humanity. It cannot be owned by any one nation. That's an interesting um, detail of fact um, that fits into the event you're talking about today. This effort of science uh, from Eisenhower, Genesis we picked today is the International Geophysical Year. Uh, we've established early on in the show that this follows NATO, that this follows the peaceful restoration after World War II conclusion. All of that is Eisenhower, Eisenhower, Eisenhower. Right. We have pictures on the wall behind us that show three things. We show the, the men who got rockets in, in, and satellites up for us, and Dwight David Eisenhower mm -hmm. standing there with the number one rocket expert in the world at the time. And in the middle, we see uh, the Earth Station side of, a, of the pole, South Pole. Um, and on the, my left over here is, uh, you told me uh, before the program started, is a symbolic starting of the first nuclear reactor. Uh, Tell us about that. Yes, uh, basically, um, and, and it, it's fairly contemporary because people still do symbolic starts of things like that. This is Eisenhower uh, symbolically turning on the first uh, nuclear reactor. Um, he was in Washington, the reactor is in Pennsylvania? Yeah, Pennsylvania. Um, and, and part of the reason he wanted to do this publicly is because of his beliefs that nuclear power could be put to very peaceful uses. Yeah. Um, can and is. Can and is. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he worked very hard to promote that. Um, you know, the, we've, we've mentioned NATO and, and technological increases. But really, the end of World War II and the beginning of the 1950s 
was a new era in humanity because we had cracked the atom. We had become able to control the very tiniest building block of, of life on Earth and extract power from it. And then the question became, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? And the very first time we saw it, it was a very scary thing right. because it created really big explosions. Eisenhower very specifically wanted people to see that that could be a very good thing. So I was here early this morning. Um, 8.30, I'm walking around, all the doors are locked, you know, because this <laughs> is a secured federal facility who has specific times to let people in. And me, I just like to show up. So <laughs> here I was walking around the quad. So I went over and said, good morning, General Eisenhower, and uh, walked around and looked at all four faces of the inscription on his statue. And every side, the word peace is there. <laughs> In some context, peace, 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 peace. It's a picture of a general. It's mm -hmm. not a President Eisenhower, it's General Eisenhower, that statue. And it says, peace, 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 peace. If there is a legacy of Eisenhower greater than his desire for peace, I wouldn't know what it is. And this scientific mission, I would contend, is still that mission, mm -hmm. the mission for right. peace in the world through trying to get people to work together. With Eisenhower was a genius well, in doing I, I, I totally agree. In addition to being a museum technician here, I'm, I'm also a military historian. And, and sometimes people do, do you find have to, it. Do you have to whip the coat off and <laughs> yeah. turn around real quick? Or people just do. You? Uh, just me. Okay. <laughs> people do sometimes find it odd that, you know, the statue is of General Eisenhower as a general, but it does talk about peace. And as a military historian, I found that some of the people who respect and want peace the most are actually the generals because they are the ones with a really firsthand understanding of right. the horrors of not having peace. Well, the Weiss family would agree with you. Yeah. My father, Uncle Clayton, Uncle Tom, all served in World War II, and I don't know, uh, uh, as growing up as a young, as a boy, all the way to, uh, to manhood, um, that, that I could have a better testimony of the value of peace yeah. through the understanding of the men who, on our behalf, prosecuted World War II. Right, and, and to relate it back to the International Geophysical Year, the U.S. government, led by uh, Dwight Eisenhower at the time, as part of organizing this geophysical year, set up certain conditions for participation. Uh, one of those conditions was that several global data repositories would be created, and all data created would not be secret. It would be shared among all the countries that participated, including countries that were not getting along, for sure. example, at the time, the Soviet Union and the US mm -hmm. at the height of the Cold War. They had to share everything they learned publicly. Mm -hmm. um, and the geophysical year still resonates today. I read an article last week um, that mentioned the Van Allen radiation belts discovered because of the geophysical year. And they've discovered that the Van, A uh, Van Allen radiation belts are actually moving further away from Earth because of ultra low frequency radio waves that we use to really? communicate with submarines. And they, they've really? kind of unintentionally created a radiation shield almost. It's mm. not quite. Um, superhero type protection yet, but right. now they're looking into it like, ooh, maybe we can protect ourselves from sunspots hmm. by using these. Wow. And totally unintentional discovery, but still research being carried on inspired by the IGY. I heard this and thought through this a couple of days ago, but uh, when uh, the light bulb finally worked, it was after the 1,000th experiment had failed. Right. So. Science oftentimes breakthroughs come what is either entirely accidental right. or looks mostly accidental. Right. It's the effort of trying. Right. It's the effort of trying. Right. This was 1957. Right. There was nothing that we know today, smartphones and all of those right. things that anybody probably had the idea of but we had, through Dwight David Eisenhower, the premise of trying to work together as humans could create value right. in science and value in peace for the right. world. Exactly. Um, you know, he, he promoted uh, science in the sense that he promoted people asking questions and looking for answers. Um, science is, is, is nothing else if not that. Questions must be asked. You try and answer the question. Right. If you don't get the answer, you, you, you maybe ask a slightly different question or 
the answer you get might, might be close enough that it takes you a different direction. Um, scientists definitely loved the concept of the uh, International Geophysical Year. Um, it's, it's, it's not a very highly studied event um, because it's not terribly glamorous and, and, and a lot of the events uh, are separated out. The space race tends to be studied as its own thing, not related to the geophysical year. But um, scientific discoveries that were started during the geophysical year, or studies, studies that were started during the geophysical year, are still yielding results. I'm going to use our last one minute to make a pitch to young people. Uh, our topic today was science. And maybe you didn't think about Dwight David Eisenhower and science being side by side when you thought about him. You thought about him as a general military. You thought him as a president, civil governance. But we want to tell you, if you're interested in science, the Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum is a treasure trove that will excite you beyond your wildest dreams. So come here, drag your parents, say, I want to go study science, and I want to do it at, at the Eisenhower Presidential Library Museum and Boyhood Home. You're going to find out they have programs for children, they have programs for young people. You're going to find the ability to research, to look, to listen, and to learn about science here. What a terrific program today, Jeff. Well, thank you. I enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, after the cameras turn off, I'm going to look at some artifacts <laughs> with my white gloves on. I'm Dennis Weiss. I work for Eagle Communications, although you really can't call this work. It's always just so much fun. Jeff Nelson, he is a technician here in the museum and a history buff, he tells me, <laughs> on the side, and he's superhuman in uniform. You come and you can be exactly the same thing. You have a great day. <laughs>